Hello, and thanks so much for joining the Invisible Americans podcast with Jeff Madrick and Carol Jenkins. We address the travesty of child poverty here. There are nearly 13 million children living in serious material deprivation in America, and we don't see them. They are our invisible Americans, and we plan to change that. A couple of words about us. The podcast is based on Jeff's book, Invisible Americans, The Tragic Cost of Child Poverty. He's an economics writer, author of seven, and co-author of another four books on the American economy. And Carol is an Emmy-winning journalist, activist, and author, most recently president of the ERA Coalition, working to amend the Constitution to include women. And we are longtime colleagues and friends. Our guests today are Connecticut Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro and Houston Food Bank President Brian Green. They are both veteran leaders in the fight against poverty in the United States. Rosa DeLauro has fought for more than 20 years for an expanded child tax credit unconditional cash payments to families, no matter how little the parents earn. Brian Green's food bank feeds a million people a year in the Houston area, and most of those people are working. But they are working at jobs that simply don't pay enough to put adequate amounts of food on the table. We begin with Connecticut Congresswoman DeLauro. In 2021, her child tax credit wish came true. The bill she had worked on for years went into effect and 5 million children were lifted out of poverty. It was a brief reprieve. When it was ended by Congress, the children's poverty rate rose rapidly. Characteristically, DeLauro is trying again. Here's our conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman DeLauro, for coming on. I called you our Shiro for, for so many years being concerned about our children and fighting poverty. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And let's set some ground rules. My name is Rosa. So let's go. (laughs) You don't have to start. I wasn't baptized Congresswoman. So there we go. (laughs) Well, believe it or not, I was baptized Jeffrey, probably the only person ever baptized Jeffrey. In any case, people have been fighting for an expanded child tax credit for so long and for so hard Mm -hmm. that once it passed, it was an extraordinary relief and we all celebrated. And then Congress knocked it down. What was your reaction personally to that? First of all, I have to say thank you to the two of you, though. But I think that when when you write about the invisible Americans and the, and the, the, the tragic cost of child poverty, there really is such a reality about that in terms of the, the economic or the financial stability, not only of the families, but the financial stability of the country. Uh, and so this is so critically important. So I, I started to wage the fight on the child tax credit in 2003. It, it got to 18 years to get it to be a, a part of the American Rescue Plan. I wanted it to be permanent in that document. And then, I, you know, we said, no, we can't make it permanent. I said, okay then let's do it for five years. And then they said, you can't do that, there's three years. And then it went down to one year. And I made the argument over and over again that this wasn't enough time in a year for one could really feel the full effect of a child tax credit so that it could be in the position of people not wanting to tamper with it in the same way they won't tamper with social security. But I was told that, well, once it happens, that it's going to be so well received that nobody is going to want to change it or do it in, et cetera. Well, that's hogwash. But I tell you what I wasn't willing to do, not to take the ball and go home. One year, going to take it. And so we go forward. And to get that tax credit out on a monthly basis uh, so that could feel that right away. What's your plan now to go forward on the tax credit? 
my fight is still to make it, it permanent. And I every single day and every time I see the president or every time I talk to his staff people, I'm going to get to the point where they walk away because they know what I'm going to say as about the permanent child tax credit. But the president's budget has the tax credit in there. It is uh, refundable. It goes at the uh, a $3,000 level uh, for kids 6 to 17. And it's got the $3,600 for kids that are under six years old. And it is until 2025. And so again, I want it permanent, but 2025 is a year when so many of the other uh, tax credits, the tax advantages are due. So I think that gives us a chance to have some real leverage in being able to move this. And in the meantime, you know, we're going to have to make a fight. Look, the fact of the matter, it wasn't just one Democrat that held this up. We have none of the Republicans. The Republicans are not there. You know, and if they want to do something like that, they want to take the money from Social Security. They, I mean, they, they want to put so many bells and whistles on it that it makes it impossible for, you know, for people. So how do you feel about the prospects for this two-year session of getting this uh, getting this done? What's, what are the likely prospects? We don't have the numbers on the House side. We just don't have the numbers. And I suspect you still have the same problem on the Senate side uh, here. But you know what I always find powerful is the external pressure on the institution. You know, you're students of all of this. When the public begins to stand up and react and get to their members and tell them that this is what we want you to do. And if you don't, you have a price to pay. I mean, that is the kind of effort that we really need right now is an external aggressive campaign that lets members of the House and Senate know how important this is. There has not been a federal program, in my view, that has had the success that the child tax credit had in a short period of time. It met the vision of the program. We haven't seen that. I, I, you know, lifting 4 million kids out of poverty, almost half the kids out of, out of poverty. The hunger rate in the country declines. You have tangible proof. People went back to work because they could afford childcare. They bought essentials, you know, all those naysayers, you know, who demean people. And they say, oh, they're going to dog it. They're not going to go to work. And some, a Democrat, said they're going to spend it on drugs. What a terrible view they have of people who are struggling every single day to make ends meet. That's a key point, isn't it? There's a terrible view of poor people that they're irresponsible, that they won't take care of their kids. And this was such a success, it's quite amazing that they let it go. Uh, amazing to me anyway. No, it is. And when when you hear from the the people who, who participated, by the way, one, they said we, we weren't going to do this. Secondly, when we talked about doing it on a monthly basis, oh, no, you can't do it. You can't do it. And, you know, I have to com compliment the IRS. They did it. They got it done on a monthly basis. And that is a key. Nobody pays their bills every year, uh, once a year. You pay your bills on a, on a you know monthly basis. But, you know, the naysayers, they said we couldn't get this in the American Rescue Plan. We couldn't do it on a monthly basis. And then they said that people, they were going to stay home from work and that they weren't going to spend it on essentials for their families, all of which was disproved, all of which, you know, from the get go. I'm never one to give up. I don't quit. You can't quit. The stakes are too high. So we'll continue at it. The president talks about making it permanent, but now we have to have the political will to get it done. And I think that that political will can be helped by massive external pressure on the institution. Right. Well, we were we were among those jumping up and down with glee to find it there and so many other family friendly positions as well. Paid leave. Exactly. Paid leave and the K and child care, affordable child care. You know, all of the things, as you say, get in the way of people leading successful, productive work lives in so many cases. This is not rocket science. You know, you say in, in, in Invisible Americans, it is about plain and simple providing 
the resources, the financial resources to families. You know, and what was, which I like so much about the way we constructed the tax credit is that 90% of kids got the same benefit. It's very similar, like to social security, that everyone can take, can utilize it. That's what I think helps to even this out. We've got middle-class families, which was a lifeline to middle-class families, low-income families, the most vulnerable families, all of whom could really take advantage of this influx of resources to change, help to change their lives. Absolutely. Uh, that's our joy over this and a recognition that poor people know how to spend their money. Thank you. Which I think too many Americans have been biased against that notion, including some prominent Democratic senators, as we know. Amen. And, and, and Jeff, it makes me cringe the way I, I see them, you know, demean hardworking people. Yep. Some with two jobs and trying to take care of themselves. And, you know, it's no soundbite to say today's families live paycheck to paycheck. They barely can keep their head above water. And, you know, we had some of the comments that came from folks, which were, were, were sad. They said, we were able to buy groceries, able to put food on the table. And, you know, now with it gone, I'm going to struggle to feed my kids. I'm not going to eat, but my kids have got to get fed. And I would add this to what you said, Jeff. Much of this is premised on values and that there's no respect for the values that poor people have, what, what drives them and what makes them really work as hard as they do. It's the American tragedy. It is the American tragedy. You watch people like a Paul Ryan talk about folks in hammocks. You know, I had the chance to write a book several years ago, The Least Among Us, the, waging the battle for the vulnerable. And I looked at how our social safety net was crafted. And, you know, it was... Democrats and Republicans who came together that said that there's a challenge that we have in this country, whatever it was. And despite our own philosophies, our own political beliefs, we have to try to tackle it. Uh, you know, we did that with food assistance, associated with, you, you know, McGovern Dole, you know, and uh, folks in housing and so forth. They came together and said you needed to do something. That's missing today. That is missing today. We wanted to get your reaction to proposal that every child who is born uh, should be given a thousand dollar. I think they considered a thousand dollar bond as an investment in their future. What do you think about that? I know it may be a step too far on this day, but do you think that's a has promise? What I concluded after looking at various proposals or efforts, the thing that struck me, and again, we kind of get to with a child tax credit, a universal, you know, assistance uh, for people. And so that I, I fixed on this is, and, you know, I, I think it's a, a good way to do it, but I'm for proposals that look to help provide guaranteed income for families. It's interesting, and in, you know, that European countries have figured this out, you know, in many, many ways. Somehow, we can't get to it. Why do you think that is? It, it just seems, you know, so counterintuitive that the least financed families can't get this kind of support. I mean, it, it's like you're too poor to get assistance, you know, in this country. I, it doesn't make any sense. That's the problem with the, the current child tax credit. We leave out a third of families and the lowest income families, you know, whether they're minimum wage families that have a large number of children, it's veterans, military families, et cetera. It's pretty extraordinary, you know, that we would do that. The people who, who need it the most. You know, as I when I told you I looked into the, the social safety, safety net, there have been moments when, when the child tax credit had bipartisan support. I mean, Newt Gingrich, he, he talked about $1,000, then he moved it back to $500, you know, et cetera. So there was bipartisan support. I think it's how people view the role of government and how should government step in or should government step in to these arenas? I obviously, and you do, I believe that government plays a very strong role that we have to when people facing the challenges that are overwhelming. 
that happened to a fairly well with the American Rescue Plan, I began to listen to people in my own community saying, thank God for the federal government, the bi business communities. I mean, when the heck did we ever hear that? And there is a very positive role. And I think that the, the child tax credit for me is where it's at. But again, I've listened to the arguments that unless you put the severest restrictions on families, people just don't want to go for it. They say, no, we can't get there. You know, we don't put the severest restrictions on the richest one-tenth of one percent of the people in this country. Like a requirement to invest in America. Bingo. They buy back their stock. We gave them a $1.7 trillion bonus here of a tax cut here. And then I've got people telling me that the child tax credit adds the deficit. Give me a break. As you know, the European nations, many of which have uh, have something like the child tax credit, don't have restrictions mm -hmm. on what the parents can spend on or should spend on. Right. Very careful research shows that. And yet we have Democratic senators who insist that money will be wasted. That's right. And they said to me directly, Jeff, I've had the conversation, the money will be used on drugs, hogwash. You know, you think about child care. State of Connecticut, it's about fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars per child. If we don't have affordable child care, or the, or parents can afford to send their kids to child care, our economy will collapse. And that happened during the pandemic with women. Women were pushed out of the workforce. They didn't opt out, and they couldn't afford child care. These are the best examples. So what did they do with that monthly benefit? They paid for childcare and then they went to work. They didn't stay home. They went to work. Well, Rosa Delora, uh, we uh, thank you for the hard, hard, consistent, persistent work that you've done for, uh, for America's children. And we hope the American Family Act has great success uh, this time around. And we're here to support in whatever way we can. We hope you'll come back and Give us progress report. We will, you, you, you know, and as I and I say, you know, I looked at that social safety net and how it was crafted, but it's time for a new social safety net, and that includes a child tax credit, equal pay for equal work, men and women in the same job deserve the same pay, paid family and medical leave, affordable child care. These are the efforts because the changing nature of what our families look like today, everyone is in the workforce. There's no one staying home if someone gets, gets sick. And since men and women are in the workforce, why aren't men and women in the same job paid the same amount of money? Why do caregivers can't go to work if they stay home with their families or they get sick? That they don't have a job or they can't get paid or they we can't look at a child tax credit and help people with their needs when we know how successful these projects should be. So for me, it is a new social safety net that we need to craft in this country. And we need to uh, really galvanize around around that kind of an effort and move that forward. Rosa, it's an honor to know you. Thank you. And the same with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. The Houston Food Bank is the largest in the United States, feeding more than a million people a year. Brian Green is running a huge enterprise aimed at keeping hunger and starvation at bay. But he's faced with the fact that instead of decreasing, hunger and food insecurity continue to rise. And now inflation presents new problems. As we've seen in news reports, there are now mile-long lines at food banks, sometimes taking nine hours to complete. Here's our conversation with Brian Green. Brian, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, I had the great honor of spending uh, some time volunteering uh, in your Houston food bank and was amazed by the sheer number of people by the organization, it is like an enormous, huge warehouse full of good hope and good things that you're doing out there. 
if you could tell us the machinery of it, how do you get, how do you feed a million people? Well, Carol, thank you so much for having me uh, on your show. So food banks actually started, you know, over four decades ago. The thinking was, if you look at how much hunger there is in America and you look at how much food waste there is in America, there's actually way more food waste than there is hunger. And I started in the early days of food banking. And I can tell you that, you know, our thinking was that if we just did enough of this, that we we would set up these uh, distribution centers, essentially, that would go pursue the surplus food and then channel it through a network of charities. And if you just did enough of that, you wouldn't have hunger. And well, so we've set up systems that do exactly that. Uh, We have fleets of trucks like Houston Food Bank, for instance. Uh, We run about 70 trucks a day. And we're picking up from the supermarkets, we're picking up from farms, we're picking up from wholesalers, uh, produce vendors, you name it, we pull in and we're distributing to about 1600 different partners to try and get this food out to families and other initiatives. I can tell you that from having done that, that, well, uh, no, it, it doesn't. <laughs> we did not solve hunger. We're actually doing enough food now. Uh, we, this food bank alone does about 14 tractor trailer loads of surplus food a day distributing out into the community, helping helping families. Uh, we serve close to a million people. You still have uh, pretty much the same amount of hunger in the United States as I had when I started. That's the mechanics of it. But the part that I think was wrong in our thinking is we, we, we thought that we could treat hunger as its own issue. It's not. Food insecurity isn't about food. Food insecurity is about income. So a family that is struggling to get by, there's there's not just one thing they're struggling to, to afford. They're struggling uh, to get by, period. And food tends to be their most flexible expense. You can pay 90% of your food cost. You can't pay 90% of your utility bill. Uh, you can't pay 90% of a medical cost. And there's so, so many things that you, that you don't have control over how much you pay. Food tends to be the flexible thing. And that's why you see food insecurity and hunger. But it also means that as we're trying to help these families, if we think of the gap as just a meal gap, we're misunderstanding the problem, we're misidentifying, we're understating it, because it's really is how much are they income insecure? That's the driver. Now, it is nice, and this uh, what makes the food banks work so well, quite frankly, the Feeding America food banks all over the country, is there is so much for food surplus that it is a great resource. So collectively, the food banks around the country are providing literally billions of dollars worth of assistance to help these families. And that's great. They're a lot better off than they, than they would be, but it's, it's not enough to overcome how much, you know, their, their gap is because they're just not making enough money to get by. And these are overwhelmingly working households. Two thirds of the food insecure households in the U S have a working adult. They're working, their wages are not enough to get by. Brian, it's Jeff Madrick here. Congratulations on your extraordinary success in building such a large operation. But then you talk about how you can't cure food insecurity. What's the goal if you have enough food? What's the goal? How do you get there? So the way we look at it now is, you know, there is this food waste and it is a resource. And for goodness sake, we should do the best we can to provide this the families. But we're looking at it as like, well, how do we do this in a way that causes the most impact? Um, so in the early days of food banking, you know, we were trying to shovel the food out the door to get to these you know, households. That was good. We now think more in terms of, well, what are the initiatives? What are the partnerships that we can use this resource that has a significant dollar value? In Houston Food Bank's case, it's like over $200 million worth of uh, resources a year. How do we cause the most impact? So one of the, mo- one of the models that we, we, we like a great deal, we call food scholarships. We work with mostly community colleges, but also a number of universities. And we target, with their help, they target the students who are struggling financially. The reality is what we're really trying to solve is they're dropping out. So you think about like with the community colleges, they've got those middle skill certificate programs like HVAC repair, uh, mechanics, truck driving, welding, medical technician. These are all degree programs that have a living wage job almost guaranteed upon graduation, all right, for completion of the, of the program. Thousands and thousands of people sign up for them. They start only about 40% complete. That's the tragedy. 
So what we're trying to do with the, the food resource is instead of just being there as an emergency safety net, is how do we make a commitment to that student, like a financial scholarship, where we're going to give what we, you know, we shoot for is like $2,000 worth of food, like a cash scholarship, um, that is kind of like food rights at one of the food marks where you can go shop for the food. It's all free for them to financially stabilize them with the goal of keeping them in the program. So that's how we're more thinking about, you know, our work. We call this shorten the line. So the originally the, the concept of food banks, we were all about serve the line. More and more food banks are saying, okay, we're going to continue to serve the line, but we really want to try and focus more on what can we do to shorten the line with these creative partnerships. But I want to be real clear on that. We will not end the line by shortening it enough. I mean, the reality is like many of these middle skills jobs that uh, people are getting trained for. Heck, when you look at what's happening with artificial intelligence and robotics, <laughs> they may not be here in 20 years. They might be here in 10 years in many, in, in many cases. You know, ultimately, this has to be about, you know, how do we ensure that everyone is able to have enough income to get by as we as a society get richer and richer? Brian, you know that our focus on, on this podcast is the children and the millions of children in, in this country uh, who are food insecure. And I love, again, what you've done is create several routes to providing them with food. I mean, we all know about lunch programs, but you have elaborated on that uh, gift as well. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the impoverished children that you're feeding? Yeah, so the first thing to point out is food banks are not the largest child hunger fighters in America. It's the schools are the number one child hunger fighting program in America, the school lunch and breakfast program. And making sure that that's maximized throughout the communities. It's amazing how how tough a battle that's been, uh, where we know that when they're providing universal lunch and, and breakfast, um, it helps all the kids. It destigmatizes um, the kids who, the, the lower income families were, with the kids where they feel like, oh, they're going to look different if, they, if they're the ones who are actually doing the breakfast, but it makes a world of difference of whether or not they're, they're going to succeed. So targeting the kids, we look at it ourselves as much as we can. We want to be supplemental to the work that the schools are doing, right? So one of the things that we do, for instance, we, we target the after-school programs like uh, Boys and Girls Clubs, YMCAs, et cetera. And so we provide hot meals for their after-school programs. But again, the real goal there isn't so much, oh, the kid got the meal. I, that's great. I'm, I'm glad the kid's getting the meal. The real goal is I want them to keep them in that after-school program. Uh, because they've been able to show that, you know, that those YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, et cetera, after school programs increase graduation rates. The kids are more likely to be successful. Then you think about, well, when is it, when is it the kids are most likely to not have food? And that's actually weekends and summer. Summer is hunger season for children. Because you think about during the summer months, the family has two extra meals a day to come up with. They don't get more money. You know, they don't have more income just because it's summer. And the rate at which kids are participating in any sort of summer meal program, it's only about nationally 11% of the children who participate in free or reduced school lunch and breakfast participate in anything in the summer. So it's a big hit there. And so we try and really ramp up to do more distribution there. I look at that work. It's kind of, you know, it's like it's stopgap. It's, you know, like kind of like being the last threads of the safety net. It's not the best solution, though. I mean, the best solution is the family having enough money to take care of the kids. So you think about summer months and how much we struggle to reach those kids in the summer food service programs that we do. It's a real challenge because during the school year, the kids are all going to school. It's easy to get them the meal because they're all there in the schools. Boom, there they are. Get them the meal. You're, they're good. They disperse in the summer, right? And so we're trying to chase them down and it's like, okay, can I get them at this community center at this park or, or whatever? And we don't reach the vast majority of them. Why on earth are we not just, for those families who are struggling, why aren't we giving them an enhanced SNAP benefit in the summer months to help, help with their kids so that they're, you know, they can do the meals themselves? It'd be a lot cheaper than, you know, than, than our way of doing it. And it'd be a lot more effective at reaching all of those kids. But again, it's, so much of it is we're not thinking of this in terms of it's what's the income of the family so that they're self-sustaining rather than, 
oh, how can I, how do I piece together all these different assistance programs so that we can get them through another week? You talk a lot about the quality quality of food as part of the hunger security program. Oh, big time. How do you get the kids to eat this stuff? I've done a fair amount of reporting in my <laughs> writing and my uh, books about how they just won't eat good stuff. What do you do to try and coax them? I'm going to take a step backwards, I, um, just because you, you've you touched on something that is de definitely a hot spot for me. You know, it really is a shame the way our food supply has evolved in the United States. You know, good nutrition is, is more expensive than poor nutrition. And that's kind of a double hit for low-income families. As it is, if, if the family is having to cut back, they're, they're food insecure. In most cases, they don't actually go hungry. What they do is they make nutritional compromises. Right. So, you you know, OK, I'll, I'll do the, the cheaper foods. Uh, they're not as good. They're, they may have long term health consequences, but I'll get by that. Uh, the high processed foods have three things that you shouldn't get a lot of. But boy, do we cram them in there. And that's fats, salts and sugar. Now, our brain, you know, craves that because our biological ancestors, boy, it was hard to get that. And so that tastes really good and it makes you, ooh, gives you a little burst of, ooh, isn't that wonderful, a little comfort food there, you feel great about it. Well, that, that's like a double whammy for low-income families because, you know, if you're in an environment where you see like, oh, we're in this rich society, I'm able, oh, you see that, you know, families are able to do all kinds of spectacular things. They have all this nice stuff. I can't afford that for my kids. What can I afford? a little bit of junk food there and a little bit of junk food there. The next, the next thing you know, the kid's habit is actually having these less nutritious foods, but ones that, you know, that hit our pleasure center quickly. And it makes you feel a little bit less poor for a while. That's being then becomes a real challenge on what to do. And a lot of times people think that the solution is, well, we need to educate people about, you know, good nutrition and more courses and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't work. So what do you do? So one of our favorite partnerships is a, is a program called Brighter Bites. It started in Houston, and they're now in a number of school systems all over the country. What Brighter Bites takes advantage of is the food bank's ability to source produce. So like in our case, 43% of our distribution is actually fresh produce. The number one surplus food that we can access these days is fresh produce. The main reason for that is what they call number twos. These are apples that are too small. Uh, these are carrots that are misshapen, you know, cabbages that, you know, that have the, the outer leaves don't look that good. Branch abrasions on the oranges. Number twos, they're just as fresh, they're just as good, they just don't look as pretty. There's billions and billions of pounds of that. So we go and source that, right? And then we bring it in. Wow, this is something we can use. Brighter Bites then takes that produce and they then go to the schools and they say, okay, look, you agree to do two eight-week programs a year where you're going to do this uh, called the CATCH curriculum. It's this nutrition education curriculum. We're going to come in and we're going to do demos and we're going to provide recipes. And then the food bank is going to provide this 30-day variety box every week. So it's like an immersion. They do it for whole classes or in some cases, the whole school at once. And they do it for two eight week periods. And the whole goal is basically you're just flooded and everybody around you is too. And everybody's doing this. You're getting the recipes, you're getting the demos, the school's teaching the curriculum and you're getting all this food. The goal is to flip those low income households into beam heavy produce consumers. And they have awesome numbers for that. So they generally have about a 90% utilization rate during the year. In other words, 90% of the families are actually using all the produce. Not too surprising. I'm giving free produce. The key, though, is that at the end of the program, for the families who actually did the, you know, fully utilized produce, it's something in the neighborhood of like 70% maintain that consumption rate after it's over. So you've actually kind of turned this into a habit. This is the kind of partnerships that I was talking about, where it's like, you know, instead of like I, I used to think, I'm just trying to get the food out to these families. I was like, how do I think of this as a resource? to try and impact the greatest amount of change. And it isn't just on, oh, okay, they've, uh, uh, um, they can get by financially, but it's like, ah, you know what, can we change you know, people's health? And the answer is, well, yes, we can. We just gotta be smart about it. Interesting. Who are, who are the some of the partners? 
another direction that we're heavily in is working with health clinics and other healthcare providers. 80% of our health outcomes is like what's going on in our lives outside of the doctor's office. This is something where we, again, can have a lot of impact. As I said, you know, 40% of our distribution plus is, is produce. I think we're going to see a day where it's 70% of our distribution is going to be produce as, as, as we do more. This is a resource that is highly relevant to healthcare providers as they're trying to get their patients to change their wellness behaviors. And so what we have is we look at, okay, here's a resource and here's also an incentive where we say, look, I'll give you this fresh produce. You know, we'll do variety boxes. We'll do, you know, you know, different distributions each week. So long as you're doing that wellness program. So like, I want to keep you in that program and I want to provide you a resource. And this is something that, you know, our local clinic providers, they're very excited about this. Now, there's a number of Feeding America food banks around the, uh, around the country that are doing these kinds of partnerships. And we're just picking on the same FQ, federal, federally qualified healthcare clinics and hospital systems, as everybody knows. You're doing all of this work. Uh, it, it is so admirable. And you say it is not the solution. You're not ending hunger. You're not. That the, that the at the core of it is poverty. What are you telling the government, the policymakers, the nonprofits you're working with, the companies? What are you saying about ending poverty? Thank you. So uh, the, the first thing I want to point out the the pandemic was has been a real learning experience, um, and it's just there's all kinds of lessons to be learned from it. But one of them is is you look at you know what was happening in the economy, you know, during this whole period. Now, our, of course, you know, when the, when the pandemic first started, our our line shot up like no hurricane ever did. We just suddenly all of these people are unemployed. Now, this is where, boom, lesson one, you look at how few resources the majority of hourly workers have, because as soon as that income was stopped, I mean, they were desperate the next day, totally living, you know, paid to paycheck to paycheck. The United Way tells us that like only about 40% of American households, no, 40% of American houses don't have $400 saved up that they can call upon in an emergency. No wiggle room, no cushion. And boy, we saw that in the pandemic, just crazy long lines, okay? Wow, you know, just like no cushion, this is what life is like. When the businesses started opening up and they're trying to get people to come back, and wow, there was a lot more reluctance and older people were saying, you know what, I'm not working now. I'm just going to, I'm not going to come back, you know, or you're going to have to pay more. And you know what, when those wages started really going up for the first time in like four decades, where wages at the bottom actually saw a significant increase, they've been just stagnant for decades. We saw it. It really had a significant impact on shortening those lines. Because again, two thirds of food insecure households are working households, people working, they're not making enough money. For the first time, we were seeing a turn in that. And that was great. The other thing, child tax credit. When those hit, we saw a big drop in the lines immediately. When that stopped, guess what happened? <laughs> the lines went right back up. It was tight. It was that, that's why like people say, oh, you, you know, you need to be asking for food assistance. You know, what works in the child tax credit was the perfect one because it most well targeted. You want to talk about the, you know, as we were doing the stimulus at the uh, you know, early stage of the pandemic. Now I get it. You know, the government had to do something and had to do stuff that they could do quickly and universally, et cetera. Not very targeted at all. So a lot of that money did not have the impact that we were shooting for. But I tell you that the things that were targeted to the low income families, especially families with kids, that had the most impact. We made our push to try and support that because that was so there was the SNAP enhancement and the child tax credit. You know, the two things the government said that had the biggest impact that we could see on the low income households, you know, like, oh, man, you know, is the the uh, the stimulus checks. I mean, like, you know, had had much more universal, but so many of the households, you know, good for you. You got the money. You didn't need it. The households that really needed it, you could really tell with those two changes. Well, Brian, you gave us the perfect closer, bringing up the child tax credit, uh, since we've been working on that ourselves. We thank you so much. We hope we'll uh, have you back again to talk about all of the great work that you're doing. And we hope that we will be interviewing people just about pure jobs, because right? I think that that's where you're pointing. pointing the. I, I know that some people not only have one, but two or three low hourly wage jobs trying to support their families. 
it is way more common than people think. Right. Uh, because, you know, so much of employment is piecing together sub 40 hour jobs. Right. It really is. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Carol and Jeffrey. It was a pleasure to talk to you. History will judge a nation's decency in various ways. One of them will surely be the well-being of all its children. American neglect of its poor children is both inexplicable and deplorable. By basic measures, it has the highest child poverty rate among rich nations in the world. A generation of careful academic research has shown how damaging this has been to children's cognition, health, nutrition, and future wages. In 2021, Congress and the president adopted an enlightened program that expanded the child tax credit and made it available to almost all children, no matter their race, ethnicity, or how little their parents earned. The results were stunning, cutting the poverty rate by half. But Congress refused to renew the program. In coming months, this podcast will examine the future of the child tax credit and other key policies to protect children from the destructiveness of poverty. We are dedicated to restoring a bright and optimistic future for all children in this land long celebrated for equal opportunity. We want to thank Brian Green and Congresswoman DeLauro, the veterans among those who fight against child poverty, for spending time with us and for their dedication to ending child poverty. If you go to our website, www.theinvisibleamericans.com, you'll find guest bios and links, as well as full transcripts and show notes of the conversations. We're adding research materials and articles on ending child poverty as we develop the site and would love to hear your thoughts. That's www.theinvisibleamericans.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you the next time.